Good evening, everyone. As you filter into the Zoom room, I want to welcome all of you to another edition of WIF's speaker series. In conjunction with our partners, Google, I'm very excited to be speaking with you tonight and to introduce you to a topic that's been floating around here in our offices for so long, in the industry for so long, and we are going to get into it tonight. My name is Ebony Adams. I'm the manager of public programs here at Women in Film. I want to send out huge thanks to our partners at the West Hollywood Arts Commission for their long-term support of our monthly speaker series. But also again, like to thank our partners at Google. This event this evening is part of our Google Shorts Lab, um, which has been an absolutely fantastic program. Please email us, go onto the website if you'd like to find out more about what that program entails and how you can support our filmmakers. I don't wanna to spend too long doing introductions, but I do wanna take care of one piece of business just to let everyone know we will be taking your questions if there's time. So if you have a question for our panelists or for our moderator, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you leave it in the chat, sometimes it gets caught up in the morass of all the talking and we don't quite catch it. But if you have a question, please use that Q&A button. We'll get to as many of those as we can at the end of the conversation. And now I would like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Kirsten Schaefer, CEO of Women in Film. And she will then welcome the rest of our panelists. So please welcome virtually Cerinthia Studer, Executive Vice President of Live Action Films, Awesomeness and Makeability in Films. Samira Pierre, Creative Executive, Impact and Racial Justice for YouTube. And Mary Viola, President of Physical Production, Wonderland Sound and Vision. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Ebony. Thanks for having us. It's great to see all of you. I thought we'd start just by having you talk a little bit about your current role and what you're working on. Um, Cynthia, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Great to be with you tonight. Um, my name is Cynthia Studer. I oversee live action films for Nickelodeon and Awesomeness Studios. Um, I like to say our development and production focus is on A to Z Gen Z on kind of the lower end of that um, being of service to like today's Nick kid as well as the Nick kid who is a parent of a Nick kid and then awesomeness um, trying to bring some light and humor to the awkwardness of you know those uh, coming of age years. Um, but uh, I'll also add, I've been a member of the board of Women in Film for, I think, four years. I start to lose track because I'm having so much fun. But anyway, nice to be with you guys. Thanks, Cynthia. How about you, Mary? So I run a company called Wonderland Sound and Vision. We make both television and feature films. The things that uh, the company's known for that predated me were shows like The O.C. and Chuck and Supernatural, and we've continued to have a really strong streak in television since then. We have three pilots right now. We have uh, True Lies at CBS. We just finished something called Not Dead Yet, starring Gina Rodriguez for ABC, and we're about to start a series called Average Joe at BET+. So that's sort of what we've been working on in television. And on the film side, our deal is at Netflix, and we have definitely enjoyed the shift to streaming, and I won't get too far ahead of this conversation, but we've really enjoyed working with our partners at Netflix, and we're about to do a movie at Amazon, and we, we tend to uh, do smart pop, and we work a lot in the rom-com genre, the coming-of-age story. What Cerinthia is talking about describe my childhood of awkward years. I'm still in them, so those are our favorite movies. We were inspired by John Hughes, and I think if you watch any Wonderland content, you'll see there is an underdog quality to almost everything we do. So. Fantastic. Love it. Damira, tell us about you and your work. Absolutely. So I'm fairly new to YouTube, Google. Um, they started this initiative to amplify underrepresented creators and communities on the YouTube platform, um, which is through the Black Voices Fund. And so I was brought on to kind of oversee that work and make sure that the YouTube originals content is aligned with diverse communities, uh, making sure that the storytelling is representative of an inclusive experience. And then I also work on the policy and procedure side to make sure that there are, is diversity in front of the camera, behind the camera, and then also um, working to make sure that everything is equitable um, in our practices and our procedures, both on the Google side and the YouTube side. So that's what I do. Thank you for doing that work. <laughs> <laughs> So I wanted to um, start, and I'll, I'll start with, with you, Mary, talking about um, what you think the most pressing 
changes are that are on the horizon? Like what's, what's changing in our business and how is that affecting what you do? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's it's funny. It, it, it'll dovetail into other things I think we're gonna talk about. I'm so happy Demir is here is just the shift that we've all been seeing is, is giving voices to people who traditionally weren't being given those opportunities. So I, I think that change has been going on for a little while. It has a long way to go. And I, I do think that that is probably the loudest change that we're all experiencing and thrilled about uh, going forward, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Sorinthia, what, what are you seeing in, in your work? Yeah, um, very much the same um, as you know. You mentioned. I think you know, especially in the space that we're in, you know, with a focus on youth. Um, I mean, they are very, very vocal about their expectations of all things, not the least of which is the content that they consume. And you know, if you if they tune in or connect to that content and they don't see themselves, they are quick to tune out, and they are also quick to call you out for for the lack thereof. So we want to be ahead of that. Um, I'm excited by what's happening there. And then kind of related to that, something that I'm just, you know, personally excited to see, you know, passionate about is all of a sudden, um, you know, um, I think there's conversation in the hallways that, you know, we speak one human language, right? And that in movies and television have always been, you know, I think stories that connect globally, but there seems to be a, a, a more stickiness to that concept now. And I'm really excited about that um, to see stories from other parts of the globe travel to the states and have the same, you know, degree of, you know, consumption and appetite as they might in, you know, their native, you know, country. Um, that's exciting. And um, to me, it kind of speaks to how, you know, content really can change the way we see ourselves. I mean, just hearing you say that, Sarinthia, just I, I think about um, you know that it it switched, right? So it used to be that we thought like, oh, everything we made in the U.S. is going to be seen around the world, which is there's still some truth to, but now finally, um, it's getting decolonized, <laughs> and <laughs> we're, you know we're watching stuff that's being made other places. That's super important. I want to dig into that in just a second. Um, but before that, I want to hear from Demir about, about what you're seeing, what's changing for you. For me, it's interesting because I've been on both the production side and the network side. And the change that I really see is that people are really into implementing policy to ensure that these stories, to ensure that underrepresented people um, have opportunity. And I think the biggest change that I am looking at is the the change of opportunity, right? You know, it's not performative in the sense of like, oh yeah, we're just, we're gonna tell, you know, diverse stories and then that's it. It's no, we're gonna tell diverse stories and we also wanna impact the communities that these stories come from. So that's the change that I've been noticing and trying to be a part of as well, so. Um, I have kind of a question that, that might be a little tricky, but let's try it. Um, I'm so excited to hear that people are, are writing policy and, and actually implementing the change, the numbers still seem like they're slow to move. What do you make of that? Well, what I make of it is, is that we're at the foundation of change. Um, as long as this industry has been around, I mean, this is very focused work that's probably started to happen within the last, I want to say five years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the numbers, you know, we have, to, we have to take it into account and, and know like, okay, this is the beginning of it, right? But what is the impact, right? So sometimes the number and the impact doesn't necessarily correspond. The mm -hmm. impact is there, but mm -hmm. now we have to get the numbers to match the impact. And so now that policies are being put in place, we'll be able to track better, um, you know, the numbers and the statistics around how this is actually changing. Mm -hmm. That's, I, I, I like that, that the, the impact is there and now we just have to get the numbers up. <laughs> Um, let's come back to this question around, um, uh, you know, globalization and s content from so many more places in the world becoming more popular um, on on U.S. based platforms. What does that mean for what you're developing? Well, oh, I'm sorry, I just jumped right in. <laughs> uh, yes, Cynthia. <laughs> oh, thanks, Kirsten. Um, I was just gonna say. Um, for one, I think as you know, a studio, it gives us a, a much 
deeper, you know, kind of portfolio of, of filmmakers and, and, and stories, you know, to, you know, discover and identify, right? Um, I think that um, there's a real opportunity, you know, to, you know, kind of take a look at what's working and what's connecting in other territories and not just, you know, acquire or lean into the format, but also lean into the creators of that content, right? What other stories do they have to tell? And then let them become a part of the broader ecosystem. I think it works to kind of expand, you know, the industry from a variety of different ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and how about you, Mary? I think my answer is probably not the right answer, but in, in a lot of ways, it's kind of upping our game because you look at something like Squid Game and that it blew the lid off of this. I think I think other things had bubbled up, but that that's the one that I think a lot of people saw the headlines and it, it really made a change. And so, you know, we'd love to do local language. We have never done that. And I think we're looking at our own content and going, we need to be just as splashy and we need to be able to, uh, you know, continue to elevate our own game. But I'll tell you the things that I've been watching were Squid Game, Money Heist, obsessed with that. And, and so for me, I'm watching it going, I wanna be just as great, but I'm not a studio. So for us, I don't think Wonderland would ever have the ability to grab something uh, and, and, and bring it here necessarily, maybe in television as a format, but not for content. Mm -hmm. We're just jealous. This is a jealousy statement for me. <laughs> And Demir, what is the um, sort of changing global market meant for YouTube? Well, it's interesting because YouTube has always been a global platform. So we're not necessarily new to the global exposure and experience of it. I think what's interesting on the global perspective is that now there's more stories that are alike than those that are different. Mm -hmm. And so the sweet spot for us is really trying to figure out how can we tell stories that resonate not just here, you know, in America, but, you know, globally, right? And so being able to source those stories and find those creators and figure out, you know, formats that we can put them in that not only is going to make sense on an American platform, but it makes sense with, you know, a creator who is bubbling up in another territory who you wouldn't necessarily see on a YouTube America platform and bridging those um, bridging those conversations and then also bridging those opportunities. So that, that's essentially what it means from a YouTube perspective is bridging more of the opportunities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Kirsten, just one thing I was gonna add to, to build on that. Um, you know, I have a young mentee who um, is an aspiring filmmaker. And when we met like four years ago, she was in high school and I was asking her like, what movies do you like and what directors you know, excite you. Um, and, you know, she had not had any, you know, fancy intro into the industry. And it was interesting, you know, many of the directors that she highlighted as of interest to her, you know, were music video directors mm -hmm. out of Korea, you know, out of South Korea and how then she's followed their career. So look at how music um, at least for this young person, inspired her consumption of film and content from another territory. So I just think that, you know, what's happening in all of our mediums um, and, you know, particularly, you, you know, from, you know, younger audiences who don't see the lines that perhaps in borders that perhaps some rest of us um, older folks may have seen in the past, um, I think it's just an exciting shift for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree that it has opened up a whole world of opportunity. I wonder if it has changed at all the way that you are kind of selecting what you make or who you partner with. Um, and I'll, I'll start with Mary and then, and then move around. <laughs> not, not, I ha haven't had experience with it shifting who we're partnering with or what we're doing. I would say, um, you know, we are trying to widen our audience and our base and the people that we're working with. We're about to start a movie based on Brazilian culture. I'm not Brazilian, but that's that's an area that I think is underrepresented. So we hired somebody who's known for social media and he's from, he came from Brazil. He grew up in New Jersey and his name is Rudy Mancuso and um, they're announcing our Brazilian co-star tomorrow. But that was exciting for me to see all the people he's pulling and all these performers in from Brazil that I would have never known about previously, but thanks to social media and the ability to, to watch and having no borders as Cerinthia talked about. 
we're able to tell the story. Whereas I think 15, 20 years ago, we, we wouldn't have just had that access or ability to do so. Right, right. Um, let's take a moment to note that there is a newish uh, chapter of women in film in Brazil. Oh, no way. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's great. Um, all right, Demira, um, how is how is this sort of globalization? Well, you know, it's different for you all, right? Because you, like you said, you've you've been in it. Um, so is it impacting your kind of curatorial process at all? No, it isn't. Um, it's, you know, just kind of going back, it's not impacting our territorial process at all, but I think the content itself is what's being impacted because now we have to be a little bit more intentional about how we program and, you know, the creators that we do go out to because we already were globally facing. Um, it kind of opens us up to a little bit more exposure because it's like, you, you aren't new to this. Like you should have a little bit more of an edge on who these people are, who these production companies are. Um, and so we're kind of like, I don't wanna say we're starting um, the trend, but it's just interesting because we've already been here. So now we kind of have to keep up how we have success in other territories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so that that's a good lead into kind of talking about um, audience demographics and desires. How do you know what audiences want? That's always the marquee question, right? I think any of us on this panel can always sit here and be in meetings and talk to research and programming and be like, well, what are people looking at, right? Um, I think, you know, from our perspective, um, we have a unique opportunity because we're creator focused. And so we're not necessarily driven by a specific audience per se, like our audience is so vast, it really just depends on the content that we want to make and the channel we want to put it on because our audience is going to be dialed into that in general. So if we have a creator where their, you know, their audience is looking for them to do X, Y, and Z, and we say, hey, we have a show that does X, Y, and Z, we come with a built-in audience. So for us, it's not saying, well, who is our audience and how do we go after them? It's oh, this is the audience that we want to go after. What is the content that we need to make? Right, right. That makes sense. Um, and how about for you, Mary? So, you know, I've, I joined Wonderland, I want to say 13 or 14 years ago. And one of the reasons I went to the company was the owner and head of the company is this director, producer named McGee. And he always had this open door policy where everybody had a voice. It didn't matter what your title was, what your position was, you had a voice. And he always encouraged banging on his door, running in and saying, hey, I read this article or I saw this show or I read this playwright and coming in and presenting an idea. And that has been consistent the entire time I've been there where we do have a lot of younger employees and people from all different walks of life who comment on scripts that come in, ideas, articles, books. Uh, They're encouraged to watch everything. We watch, read, consume everything out there. And I think one of the ways we've stayed ahead is we have partnered with people off social media that we felt were the most talented and had risen you know, to the top of the pile and regrouped with them and said, what do you want to do? What kind of stories do you want to tell? Put them in front of the camera, put them behind the camera, um, try to make overall deals with them, do one-offs with them. Because um, we, we do tend to skew a bit younger. Like I said earlier, we do more smart pop and we've stayed kind of ahead of the curve where our companies made an effort to, to go where the puck is going, not where the, the puck is. And so that's something that we've put a lot of focus and energy into and it's paid off where we feel like our content again is smart pop, it's elevated pop culture. And, and so we read literally everything out there and have meetings and, and talk internally, but with every single age group, uh, ethnicity, a a everybody has a say in our company, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's good, that, that's really great. Um, and so, Cerinthia, how, how are you all um, getting to know what your audiences want? Yeah, I mean, we, we connect with them on so many platforms. Um, obviously, we have like the linear platform for Nickelodeon, but Nickelodeon is, is also ubiquitous on digital subscription platforms. Um, the same with Awesomeness. You know, our brand um, started as a digital native, you know, content brand and now has evolved in a lot of other platforms and mediums. Um, so, you know, we, we, we really like to focus, we know exactly who we are in service to. 
Um, so we spend time really connecting with them. So whether it's, you know, insights from our social teams or our research teams, um, we're constantly, you know, connecting into what they're talking about and what matters to them. It's interesting. I think it was, uh, let's see, maybe it was a year and a half ago now, we did a really impactful um, study called Shades of Us um, that um, particularly leaned into, you know, kids of color and their insights on the content that they were being exposed to. And it was really interesting. Um, and, you know, at, at times kind of just um, disheartening to understand how they were absorbing the lack of representation as they saw it in their media. And boy, did that, um, propel us, as did so many other things that were happening in the world uh, about a year and a half ago, you know, to really just, you know, put our foot on the gas with regard to representation. So it'll always be a part of who we are. Um, I think it, it kind of almost starts with these audiences, right? You know, our, our kids tend to change the way that, you know, it starts with them. And then we see the changes kind of expand, you know, broader than that. So it's a pretty exciting place that we're in um, to, to be able to kind of follow their lead in terms of what excites them, motivates them in terms of content. I said a little kind of back of the envelope um, kind of count the other day or looking at um, like iconic kind of female characters in film and television. Um, oh, I started with superheroes. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot more female superheroes, but you still like, it's like Wonder Woman. Like it still comes back to kind of like, there's one that kind of everybody knows who's been on every platform. Um, and when you start looking at the kids shows, there are, there's way more diversity in kids shows. And then even getting into the teen shows, when you start getting into adult shows, it really drops significantly. And especially around that question around iconic female characters, like mm. there's not many. Um, and I, I wonder what it's going to take to, to make that shift where we, where we're seeing more stories really with women at the center. Like I was surprised. I thought we were doing better. <laughs> so, so how are, how are you all thinking about this and how are you able to sort of move this forward in, in your companies? Um, Demira, we'll start with you. So essentially when it comes to, you know, I'll just speak from you know the black voices perspective, right? And so, women, African American women, um, specifically, you know, in media, we haven't necessarily been represented in storytelling that's you know, that's broad, right? And so, when I'm looking at content and I'm getting pitches, and I'm getting you know different opportunities to create platforms and stories around the African American woman's experience, the approach that I take is that, okay, well, what is the story that we wanna tell about these women? And then how is, what is the thread that makes them common to you know, other women and other groups? And so that's the approach that I take is like trying to figure out like, what is the commonality between, you know, black women versus other groups of women and making programming that reflects just that point instead of isolating and saying, oh, this is about a woman um, it's no, this is about a woman who is also dealing in everyday life. She just happens to be black, right? And so that's the approach that I kind of take when I'm looking through content and, and specifically around women is what is the what is the commonality? What is the common story that I can pull out and how can I amplify that throughout whatever the content is? Mm -hmm. I like that, I like that. Um, how about for you, Mary? I think we've kind of taken the put your money where your mouth is approach. Uh, a lot of our films, most of them are uh, female driven. And, you know, it's interesting to hear what Demir is saying is that we teamed up with Tiffany Haddish to do a superhero project called Mystery Girl that we're working on. And I know, and I don't want to speak for her, but the legend is Tiffany went into a comic book store and said, I want to see all of the comic books that were, I could play the lead. And I think there were like four. And that's in an entire comic book store. And so I think hearing that story and reading Mystery Girl, which was awesome, um, got us excited to team up with Tiffany to try to make change. And we just did it on this pilot that we just wrapped for ABC uh, called Not Dead Yet, where we had a lot of different choices for the female lead. And we chose to go with Gina Rodriguez for a number of reasons. She's one of the most talented actresses of her age group. 
Um, and she's amazing in so many ways, but she and I connected on wanting to make a change in front of the camera, behind the camera for people that don't really get a voice. And everybody unanimously wanted to cast her and she delivered, I mean, beyond what we ever could have thought, but that was, you know, a conscious choice to try to, you know, it was written, it didn't need to be any specific uh, race. It was, it was just a girl who was down on her luck and we wanted to put Gina in the role. And so I think our approach as a company, you know, we're, we're not Cerinthia, we're not Demira, we're not a, these big content providers, we're a production company. So we're a little limited other than being able to literally just try to cast and choose stories that will elevate women of mm -hmm. all different races. Mm -hmm. And can I can I just chime in on that point? Um, because what I noticed in the difference in in scripted content versus unscripted content is that women, female characters aren't necessarily able to play fictional scenarios. Hmm. And so in unscripted content, I think there's a lot of dominant female leads. And so that's the difference that I noticed is that it's the scripted content where the female character is re relegated to a certain role that's more realistic versus something that's more, you know, obtuse. Um, so yeah, so that that's kind of what I've noticed and I could be completely wrong, but I'm just partial to unscripted. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're I, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, Cerinthia, um, no, oh, I lost the thread of my own question. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I derailed. Oh, no, I'm that's sorry. okay. No, no, no. I, I, I think I, I, I was, I was, you know, mulling over what, what you said. And when I did that search for I can't iconic female characters, I was looking at scripted content, both in film and TV. So now I, I went to the place of, oh, how about unscripted? But that <laughs> went down that rabbit hole maybe a little later. Um, uh, so, Cerinthia, how? Um, how are you all thinking about creating more? I mean, you're in the you're in the zone where I think there is more di more diverse characters in front of the camera. Um, but as as the audience kind of moves up in age, how do we um, get get more women of color, women from all different kinds of backgrounds, women with really diverse stories into some of those those you know adult films? Yeah, no, um, it, it's interesting. We're actually in production right now um, on a film called Fantasy Football in Atlanta. And it was a project that was brought to us um, by our partners at um, Spring Hill uh, Entertainment. Obviously they have um, quite a pedigree um, with regard to inclusive storytelling and, and storytelling that kind of lives in the world of sports. And when the project first came you know, to us, it was a, uh, story of a, you know, a, a, a son and father kind of at the, the heart of it. And, you know, when we kind of delved into the property and just thought about, you know, kind of the type of story that we wanted to tell, we, we kind of, you know, dialogued with our partners and we were all seeing it the same way. Like, why can't we have a young teenage girl, you know, at the helm of a sports movie that revolves around football, that has a component of connection to gaming, right? And that helped us um, attract our lead and co-producing partner, Marseille Martin, who's a um, producer at her, with her company, um, Genius. And um, not only that, but we, um, without really intentionally doing it, we hit a sweet spot of uh, an audience that was very important to EA, who's also a partner because there's a gaming component to the movie. And as they started to share kind of their stats around young women and young girls and their depth and knowledge of gaming, you know, it was interesting because all the data was there, right? About how women, young girls are consuming and, and active in a variety of areas of sports or with gaming, but it's not so ubiquitous in terms of the stories we tell each other through our content, right? So it was a wonderful opportunity for us to really kind of be in touch with where our audience is by actually showcasing it to the world through film. So uh, I'm really excited about the, the, the potential and the promise of that movie and hopefully it being kind of a a spark that will, you know, launch more deeply representative, you know, storytelling that kind of breaks down some of the stereotypes, if you will, of 
a young girls or young women. I'm excited to see that. <laughs> so you mentioned a little bit the kind of interplay between gaming and um, you know film, television. There, there is so much kind of crossing over right now and and blurred lines, um, as well as you know we have screens everywhere, right? That that's like not new news anymore. Although it seems like there are more and more screens everywhere. <clears throat> What does this mean for the, you know, the kinds of content that you all are, are choosing to, to sort of put your weight behind? You know, are you thinking about it differently because of that kind of interconnectivity of, of all of the both mediums and the, and the distribution mechanisms? I'll start with you, Mary. We are new to this too. We're trying to figure out the different entry points, kind of just touching upon the surface of it, like you're saying, is it is there a book in existence? Can we build a game around it from the bottom up? I think previously studio systems would would try to build a game around the movie that they would be putting into production, but the timelines never ever matched up. And I think that's changing now with technology. Everything can be so much faster. And I think in a way, um, while this isn't exactly the same, I think there's something exciting on the horizon with NFTs. Because I think people are not only trying to acquire viewers, we're all watching in the news, people need to figure out how to keep them. And I think giving people a piece of a project or a special uh, you know, image or NFT where they feel some ownership and they're invested is probably something we're going to see a lot more of. So those are the kinds of things we're kicking around at our company. We're not a gaming company. We, we, don't, we haven't done that, but we're trying to see what that could lead to in, in other spaces and we're exploring those things. Mm -hmm. that's, re that's really interesting. Um, Damira, I, I really want to know how this is, <laughs> what this looks like in unscripted space. So for unscripted, just kind of going back to the point where a lot of the leads are women. Uh, for us, we're being really intentional about the behind the scenes. Um, so a lot of the characters that you're seeing in front of the camera are now wanting to be content creators, producers, directors, um, storytellers in their own right that where they're just not relegated to be talent. So that's more of the trend that we're seeing um, is them coming from in front of the screen and coming behind the screen and working hands on and creating, you know, with other talent and bringing other women along for the journey. Um, and is there, um, is YouTube, I mean, YouTube is wildly successful in the space that it's in. Is there any other, is there any movement in, in your kind of part of the, the YouTube world around, you know, into NFTs or gaming or other kinds of? That's an interesting question because um, YouTube actually just announced that it will be investing a lot of uh resources into gaming in the uh, EMEA demographic. Um, and so now I looked at that, I was like, oh, wait a minute, there's an opportunity because not only is it investing in a niche market, it's investing in a market that's underrepresented, period, right? So now we're looking to figure out how do we tell stories in this space? And then how do we also bring an audience um, to this niche world of gaming, to this niche world of NFTs? And what does that look like for the platform? So Google is definitely trying to figure out, you know, how do we play? How do we become, um, you know, a leader in that in that world for sure? Um, but I'm that's that's a little high level for me. I don't know what goes on on the NFT and the Google side. Um, between between us, there's a room of people who kind of scavenge and figure all that stuff out that I haven't got access to just yet. <laughs> Well, they need to bring you into that room because there's a whole world for black creators in there, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm in there hearing the tidbits of what's going on and just kind of taking it and, and figuring out how do I, you know, use my position, you know, with the BBF fund and try to figure out synergy around that. So there is conversations, but as far as the high level work of getting involved on the ins and outs and the day to day of it all it's still, they're still working that out, working the kinks out because it's still a very new space. Like this whole idea of like web three and NFTs, like people are trying to figure out like, what does that look like um, for content creators? What does that look like for content period? I think one of the things that's very interesting is the metaverse, right? Mm -hmm. And creating content in that space, so. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. Um, what, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about 
the ways that the industry is changing and what's coming down the pike? Like, what's exciting to you? I mean, we, we talked about, you know, the changes around diversity and inclusion, which, um, you know, is, is core to the work here. But how about the ways that other ways that things are changing in technology? What do you see that's exciting? For me, I'm always interested in how can we get audiences to experience an interactive component, right? Because, you know, what the pandemic really taught us is that, you know, people want to be engaged, people want to have community. And this whole metaverse world where you can kind of go into a whole nother dimension and really experience, you know, community and content, like trying to figure out like, oh, my next thought or idea is how do I create something where people can do like a choose your own adventure type of thing and have a group of people choose, literally choose their own adventure and write the story. And we give them the framework of what the story could be, but they figure it out within this metaverse space. And that sounds fun. I'm, I'm, I'm up for that. <laughs> um, how about you, Srinthi? What's exciting to you in the sort of the, the ways that technology is changing? You know, um, gosh, I mean, I mean, just the, the, you know, the ability to, you know, reach audiences like without, you know, any delay that we can kind of, um, you know, put content on the platform on any particular platform and then even watch like content spawn from it, right? Like I love the idea of how, or, or what we've seen in, in many cases where, you know, there's original content that's being created by fans of what might have been our originating content, right? Like that um, people are making it, um, you know, kids and young audiences uh, in my side of the world, they're, they're making the content their own. Um, you know, I look at how my son engages, you know, with, you know, the gaming platforms like Roblox and Minecraft, and it's a world that he drops into. Um, and to him, he's creating a story every time he, you know, starts gaming. So I, I think that's just, a, you know, which kind of gets into Demir's, you know, point about kind of the multiverse and how you can, you know, have, you know, enriching stories that can build from that. Um, I think it's really exciting and I'm, I kind of am kind of getting educated, one, through my son, but two, you know, through where our audience is spending their time. So it's very cool. And how about you, Mary? What's, what's changing technologically that's exciting to you? I think definitely NFTs, metaverse, watching that. Although I see all of the, like the articles about my sad day in the metaverse and, you know, I'm like, oh, can they just please fast forward to when this is going to be cool. Um, <laughs> but I think the other thing, it's probably obvious, but I still find it exciting growing up in the middle of nowhere and then being in Hollywood right now, it was a dream come true, but very hard to pull off. I think now everybody's got a phone in their hand, which is a camera, which means they can create a movie, they can do anything. And you look at some of these young people running around making short films and I can access them and give that person a chance. And I look at somebody like Addison Ray, where not too long ago she was dancing in front of a screen and now she's got a deal at Netflix and she's starring in films. I just, I look at that and I'm like, wow, technology did that. You know, it's just, people being talented but having the access to to get their their talents out there so that to me is is really exciting yeah i i totally agree with that um we have a question from an audience member who's asking um about the uh people with disabilities population and how when in your companies when you think about diversity um how that how that factors in um anybody want to take this one yeah, I, I will just say, um, you know, being a part of Nickelodeon, um, you know, I don't know, know if you guys remember, but like when, um, you know, part of Nickelodeon's DNA, like when they, you know, and just even historically, you look back at Nickelodeon, like one of their, um, I think it's called the Kids Bill of Rights, right, and in which we made a statement back, what was it, 30 plus years ago when the network launched, um, you know, that we would make a commitment to creating content that allows kids to be seen and heard. Um, I'm paraphrasing it, but, um, you know, in that, that's that's all children to be seen and heard. And I can tell you, um, I wish I'm sitting, I wish I were here sitting, telling, uh, sitting here telling you about, 
there's two projects in particular I was so passionate about um, pursuing that unfortunately um, we didn't end up getting, but you know, at their core, you know, the the protagonist, you know, um, that was telling this very, you know, connecting story was, you know, a, a, a protagonist that um, had, you know, a degree of, um, you know, uh, representative, you know, physical uh, abilities and or challenges. And, and I say abilities because I think there's an opportunity to turn what we think um, about, you know, individuals um, with, you know, disabilities, turn that on its head and see, you know, kind of their superpower as a heroine, perhaps of a, a story. And those are the kind of things that really attract me. So um, if I'm succeeding, you're going to see more and more of that in our representative telling storytelling. Thanks for that, Cynthia. Any additions? I just think um, from a production company. Oh, I'm sorry, Demira. Do you no, want to go? go ahead. <laughs> I just have a little thing to add for me because it goes back to what I said earlier. For for the seat I'm in, it's really a mon put your money where your mouth is, and that's an area we've discussed internally that we need to be be better at. And I hope our pilot makes it on the air because we have a character that definitely qualifies and and would help in this cause. So as, as in real time, we are trying to address this, and I think it needs to feel mainstream and, and be more inclusive. And I hope other people are, are taking steps and strides and, and doing what we're trying to do by, by putting these characters on the screen as well. And just to kind of speak to the YouTube part of it, um, we're very intentional in terms of uh, broadening what you know diversity means. And so for us, it's one of our markers and buckets to feel that we have representation from, you know, well, well able-bodied people along with people who are disabled and making sure that those stories are resonating throughout all of the platform, not just on the YouTube original side, but it's, we're being inclusive throughout the whole platform. So that means making sure that people have access and are able to participate in YouTube um, in a way that's, you know, comparable to anybody else who's able to participate. And so there's processes, there's technology um, and opportunities that we're, that's especially a sign that people are always focused on and making sure that it's inclusive in everything that we do throughout Google and YouTube. Yeah, I would say that sure behind the camera as well. And, and we see Crystal Rivers chiming in. We just want you to know we hear you, we see you, and we are doing our best to, to make a difference out there. Thanks, Mary. Um, I have another question for you specifically, which is about production. How is production changing right now based on the kinds of content that you're creating? I think for us, the, the biggest change we've seen over the past few years is quantity. It's just everybody is busy. And I think it goes back to what you were saying about there's so many screens, there's so many ways for people to consume content in all different forms, long, short. Um, we've never been busier. And I'm happy about that. This is not a complaint. Um, but we've never we've never been busier and we are being given the opportunity to tell things that maybe wouldn't have been traditionally told in, in a television capacity or uh, a film capacity you know we make rom-coms rom-coms were were dead years ago uh nobody wanted to touch them and our company's making lots of them and they're successful so uh i think i would just say that that's the way that we've been affected is we're being given opportunities where you know, theatrical is shrinking for a, a variety of reasons and movies that weren't being shown are now becoming, um, th there's opportunities in streaming. So we're taking advantage of that and, and work, working 24 seven. Right. <laughs> um, there's a couple questions from the audience about um, the Netflix stock fall um, this week. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, all of the choices that there are now for, for streaming. Um, and what do you all think about the future of streaming? So I'll start with you, Cynthia. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's, it, it kind of gets to the point that Mary, you know, just mentioned, it's like, even, you know, for all of us who are quote unquote fighting for resources, right. For both, you know, in front of and behind the camera on um, talent, it seems like, you know, there is a capacity issue. But in the world of you know streaming and the ubiquity of content across platforms, there there is no ceiling, right? So there is, um, you know, quite honestly, just a, you know, 
as, as much as we make, we find, you know, audiences, you know, consuming. I think there, perhaps, I think it'll, what's going to change, it'll be interesting to see how we actually measure um, uh, the success of, of content with the ubiquity across so many platforms, um, how people will connect. Um, but there's a lot of room, you know, for, you know, new content, because I think the appetite uh, of our audiences is, are pretty deep. Mm -hmm. um, along along these lines, an, another um, audience member is asking if there's any studies that you know of about who's using streaming the most. Um, and this is kind of part of that that bigger sort of question about with so many streaming services, um, and you know people have limited budgets. Um, kind of what what's the long game here? Do you have a take on that, uh, Demira? I, I do not know any formal studies, but just in my kind of day-to-day -day experience, um, I think what's interesting is um, the older population and community is streaming like heavily. Um, like the you would think that YouTube, our audience is millennial Gen Z, but we index pretty high with uh, 34 to 50 demo. Mm -hmm. And they're on the platform and they're staying for an extended amount of time. And it's like, oh, huh, look at that. <laughs> Is this a market that we should be catering towards? Um, so I don't know any studies, but I think the thing that, that is insightful is this, you know, this older demographic that you would think traditionally they wouldn't be, you know, innate to streaming, but they're, they're there. They're there. They're showing up. They're present and they're staying. So <laughs> what are they watching? <laughs> well, um, a lot of renovation YouTube videos, uh, yeah. um, a lot of escapism stuff. So like hiking, adventure, lifestyle type content. Um, so that's where it's over indexing at. Cool. Cool. <laughs> Mary? I was just going to see if you saw a blip for like Model T's around 1932, because my dad goes down the YouTube rabbit hole. This is backing up what you're saying. I would have said a few years ago. It's all a young person's game for streaming, but no, my my dad's a big YouTuber now. And the fact that my mom understands how to stream, I think it's showing a shift into the uh, older categories, much more than 54, 34. It's, we're talking 70s and 80s. I think they're coming. They are coming and they're figuring out how to unplug from cable slowly, but surely. Um, I don't have any formal numbers either, except I think for, for our company, we definitely target a younger demographic. We'll continue to do that. Uh, teens up until thirties and forties, but, um, but the, the older folks, they're there. Yeah. And, and we do often hear that, um, they're, you know, older people are, you know, core audience, um, for film, for, for theater going. Um, and also there's not a lot of content created for older people. And so mm -hmm. this, this makes total sense. Yeah. Um, all right, we have another question here that is, um, given that the Asian market is so big, is there an intention to, to make more Asian American content? Um, and I, I would also say in that, um, I wonder if there's a, the assumption that, Asian, that Asian American content would cross over into the Asian market. So maybe we'll just expand this question and say, um, is, do any of your companies plan to make more Asian or Asian American content? I mean, I was, well, oh, please, Demir, sorry. Well, I, I was going to say that, you know, under this, um, you know, diversity initiative that YouTube is looking at, you know, the Asian community is definitely somewhere where we're indexing and trying to figure out how do we, you know, cross, you know, promote, how do we cross these stories and figure out how to amplify stories that are, you know, resonate within that demographic. Um, one episode that we just launched that just came out um, is our recipe for chain series, which kind of categorizes or basically follows different um, ethnic groups. And one mm -hmm. of the episodes is, uh, it's called Stop Asian Hate. And so that one is, kind of like our first for a way into really leaning into the conversations around Asian community. Um, so shameless plug, go go watch it. It's really great. Um, and then we also have the second installation, which is anti-Semitism. And yeah, we have a third one that I can't announce just yet, but it's going to be really good. So 
check those out if you have a chance. <laughs> Um, one of the audience members just right before you said that asked um, are, if people are watching social justice films. Um, and I think you just answered yes, right? Um, yes. Yes. Um, are, are you, um, Cerinthia, are you finding that in the, the kind of content you're making that people are more interested in social justice themes than ever before? Yeah, you know, I... Um... Part of our, you know, profile, um, you know, with awesomeness is, you know, to make, you know, movies that, you know, kind of are very authentically representative, you know, to our, you know, broader demo. Um, and in doing that, I think there's a degree of inauthenticity if you ignore or, you know, kind of, uh, you know, whitewash the realities of the world. Um, I think with everything that we do, I like the idea that there is a through lens of um, social or cultural relevance in the content. Um, I look at what we did with our, you know, poppy, yummy, you know, film series, you know, um, to all the boys um, and just, you know, what that one movie did to, you know, kind of open up, you know, perspective on, you know, the diversity within, you know, the Asian American, you know, community, um, the, you know, connection and connectivity to, you know, um, to culture and how it was um, so sweetly represented in that movie. And now, you know, from it, we've had the success of multiple films and, uh, a series that is actually in you know the midst of production in South Korea right now that's a spinoff um, of the, the movie so um, you know of course I'd love to replicate that um, in some or form or fashion but ev everything that we do I think needs that degree of of honesty relative to the the world and the communities that we're a part of I mean I love the social justice rom-com Hey, <laughs> uh, that seems that seems what, like that's right up your alley, Mary. I know. I think I got to talk to Sorinthy after this and see if we can team up on that. We must. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Demira, there's um, a request for you to name that series again that you talked oh, about. Oh, the series. It's produced by our partner Spring Hill. Um, it's called Recipe for Change. It's three installations. The first two are, are out now. Um, the first one is Stop Asian Hate. The second one is around anti-Semitism. And the third one, I cannot announce it. They would slap my wrist, but it's going to be really, really good. Um, look to tune in to YouTube May uh, 19th. That's when the third one will launch. Um, so those are the two that are out now. Recipes for Change. Recipe for Change is the series, yes. Recipe for Change. Um, Ebony, will you do me a favor and pop that in the chat? Absolutely, for sure. Um, or Haista, because we we don't have access to it. I don't think panelists, but Ebony does. There she goes. She's going to put it in the chat for us. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I think we we're we're getting to the end of our time here. Um, I wonder if there's if there's anything else that um, you all either are really excited about or are see as a huge hurdle or challenge in the industry that you want to name, you want to talk about as our kind of final comments here. Um, Mary, I'll start with you. I think it's just something we're all seeing in the news, uh, and you alluded to it earlier, is just how do you not only attract viewers, but keep them? And I think that is going to be something everybody is, is fighting for at the moment. Like, what is that special recipe? Obviously, it's quality content. Um, it's enough content. There's a lot of things out there that I think everybody's having that conversation right now. Right. Yep. I, I agree. That That's a big topic. Oh, Demira was able to put it in the chat. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Um, apparently you are better at Zoom than me because I was having a hard time figuring that out. <laughs> um, so Demira, what, what are you either um, feeling excited about that we haven't had a chance to talk about or see as a hurdle? Um, I'm, I'm really excited about, you know, just kind of reiterating this, this, you know, whole idea around policy and change and the opportunity of what it looks like to formally um, have companies and organizations really take efforts to, you know, like you said, like increase those numbers. 
Um, so that, that way the numbers reflect the impact and the imp and then when we can have the numbers, we then get the funding to continue to move in these directions. So that's what I'm really excited about. The hurdles that I see that I, I definitely am, you know, optimistic around overcoming is really telling the narrative of why these things are important to have. Because obviously when we have different headlines that make the news around, you know, Me Too and Time's Up and the whole George Floyd, everybody is rallying to try to figure out how to fix it. But then once those flames kind of burn out, it becomes like, oh, okay, well, you know, it's, it's not on trend anymore. And so the hurdle is like, this isn't a trend. This has to be what we are committed to doing. And it has to be in the fabric of the companies that we work for and the content that we're putting out, so. 100%, it's, it's why, um... We are still here at Women in Film, almost 50 years old. So um, keep going. <laughs> Cynthia. Um, you know, I think a hurdle for our industry is, is, is if we, you know, don't, you know, correct it, I think it could be, have it impact down the line. And that's just, you know, making sure that we have the, most evolved uh, rooms of creatives and executives, um, um, both the content creators and decision makers that they need to be very reflective of our society. We have a lot of work to do. Obviously we're tackling, tackling a lot of that at Women in Film and I'm so proud of everything um, that we do as an organization. But it's it's an uphill battle to change what the rooms around this industry look like. But I know we're all up for the fight. Um, and and that, if not corrected, I think that'll be a hurdle because then our content will be out of touch. Um, right. Our content won't connect. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes back to that globalization point we started at the very beginning. It's like if we don't break, um, embrace it, there will be some of us in this industry, at least relative to this, this domestic environment, I think will be left behind um, and will have an impact on revenue. So I, I really do hope that um, we add a lot more diversity to our own, you know, uh, room spaces, offices, et cetera, so that we do get to see um, a deeper profile of, of content. Cynthia, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And through through the women in film lens, we see it with all the women in film chapters that are starting to pop up around the world that have never existed before and so excited about it. But I think it also reflects growing industries in all of these different countries. So we can, you know, no longer assume that you know, everything is created in the US and, and shipped around the world, um, but that it has to go both directions. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, thank you all so much. Um, it's been great to have you and to have you share these insights and be a part of this community. Really appreciate it. Um, and I hope you have a lovely evening and thanks to all of our members and others who have tuned in. Um, have a good night.